Good morning, everybody. It's Friday morning, September 9th. Welcome. I'm Ankita Sagar. I am a primary care physician, as well as the VP for Clinical Standards and Variation Reduction at the Physician Enterprise. I want to introduce Dr. Quinn, uh, who is joining us as my co-host today. Take it away, Dr. Quinn. Oh, thanks, Dr. Scar. I'm Rob Quinn. I'm a uh, physical medicine and rehab doctor by training. And in fact, for much of COVID, the unit that I uh, directed was half filled with COVID patients with assorted uh, uh, maladies related to COVID requiring longer term hospitalization and rehab. I'm uh, the senior vice president for Physician West, uh, meaning uh, the head of the physician enterprise in California, and I'm eager to be educated. So uh, I'll get out of the way. Back to you, Dr. Scar. Thanks, Dr. Quinn. So I'm going to post a quick reflection, which we feel is very timely. So um, September marks Women in Medicine Month. And I thought that this was a very poignant quote, but also a poignant illustration of everything that women in medicine have done over the last few years. To quote Michelle Obama, people who are truly strong lift others up. People who are truly powerful bring others together. So this is in honor of all the women in medicine because you have brought us together in the most powerful ways and continue to lift others up in the many, many ways beyond just professionally. So we thank you very much. And we couldn't possibly celebrate it in a better way than to introduce to you a panel of phenomenal women in medicine to talk about something that's very near and dear to all of our hearts, which is COVID related concerns, specifically thinking about long COVID. So stick with me while I introduce them. So Dr. Fida Shaib is an associate professor of medicine and she's the chief medical officer of Baylor Medicine as well as the medical director of Baylor Medicine Sleep Center. She received her medical degree from American University of Beirut in Beirut, Lebanon and completed an internal medicine residency at the University of Louisville. She also completed a pulmonary critical care fellowship, as well as an adult and pediatric sleep medicine fellowship at the University of Texas. We also have on the panel, Ms. Alyssa Love, who is an assistant professor in the School of Health Professions Physician Assistant Program at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. She is a Baylor trained PA who has over 25 years of clinical experience in outpatient primary care and currently serves as a key member of Dr. Shaib's care team in the post COVID clinic. And we have Dr. Maureen Tierney, who is the chair of the department and associate dean for clinical research and public health at the Creighton University School of Medicine. She is also the medical director of clinical research at CHI Health. Dr. Tierney attended Fordham University. She received her MD from Cornell Medical College and MSc in Health Policy from the Harvard School of Public Health. In 2020, she was named the inaugural awardee of the McKnight Prize for Healthcare Outbreak Heroes. During her time at Creighton, she has been involved in a study of post-COVID sequelae led by the CDC at sites including Creighton CHI, UT Southwestern, and Mount Sinai in New York. Welcome to all three of you. We are very excited to hear from all of you. And I'll move this on to Dr. Shai. Please take it away. Uh, thank you, and happy um, Women in Medicine Month. I hope uh, we are celebrating you, uh, whatever you are practicing, and thank you for all you do. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So it is really my pleasure to be here uh, with you this morning um, to share with you our experience with uh, taking care of post-COVID-19 patients. Um, in, this, in this talk, I'll be sharing with you uh, uh, how our uh, clinic developed and uh, some of the observations and the interventions we we're doing. So um, this has been a challenge. I have to say it takes a whole uh, institution and whole community uh, to be able to uh, support such an operation. So I'm very thankful for uh, Baylor College of Medicine and all, and all of my colleagues who came together to, uh, to make this happen. I have no disclosures. Um, I will talk about um, long COVID, uh, whatever you wanna call it, long haulers, post-COVID-19, 
Uh, finally, we have a very non-specific diagnostic code that we are commonly using. The, the value of this is just to be able to track those patients in the electronic medical record. As we see, it's post-COVID-19 condition is unspecified. Uh, we still have lots of work to do in defining uh, the problem. Uh, when we start taking care of COVID patients and we started looking at the acute presentation, the whole world was busy with managing acute uh, illnesses, but then data start coming out about the long-term um, residual or persistent or new symptoms that can uh, develop. And uh, this is an article from April uh, 2021 that talked about the major uh, uh, organ system that could be affected with, with post-COVID. And um, uh, it went to 12 weeks, six months, but uh, we're gonna uh, learn more about today that this can really go beyond, beyond that period of time. So when we started uh, seeing patients in the clinic, I'm a pulmonologist, so started seeing patients who come in uh, with uh, shortness of breath, and we uh, were faced with an illness that didn't look like any other illness. There was no definition. There was no diagnostic criteria. Uh, we know that what was common for patients that they had uh, uh, COVID infection um, uh, confirmed um, or not. Some of them uh, had symptoms even before we had any testing. Um, uh, so we, we, we never really wanted or requested a, a positive test. We accepted patients as they came in with the, with the complaints. And um, those people uh, had uh, microbiologic recovery. They had a negative test, most of them, uh, but they still had persistent symptoms. And the symptoms were interesting. They were multiple. They could be constant or relapsing and, and remitting. And we, had, we also saw a few patients who uh, had similar symptoms to this patient population who were uh, coming after the, the COVID-19 vaccination with no history of infection. So we initially struggled with definition. We struggled with how do we take care of, of those patients. And, and as more literature came out, and you guys are, are familiar with this, lots of, of, of patients have uh, had COVID infection and continued to have at least 80% had at least one symptom persistent, um, um, while some people maybe recovered and then had symptoms uh, after that. So what, you know, we, ha we have more uh, information now. I think when we look at the pathophysiology and it's all up for discussion still, we talk about the um, uh, what could be causing this uh, um, lingering uh, illness after a viral illness. And uh, the different theories are about direct viral induced tissue injury. And this is, this is relevant really to uh, organs like the lung, uh, uh, brain, uh, kidneys, um, uh, et cetera. Uh, uh, there is the theory about endothelial injury, uh, immune system dysregulation, and stimulation of hyperinflammatory state. We see lots of positive uh, autoimmune markers in this patient population, but that they don't make a diagnosis for any of the um, uh, rheumatologic diseases, but there is an immune system activation. There's hypercoagulability, um, uh, thrombosis, um, history of DVTs and PEs, and, and maybe related also to the angiotensin converting enzyme uh, pathway. So different uh, theories um, um, that could be triggering this illness, um, is it the, the immune system that got hyperactive? Is there residual viral uh, presence, viral particles in the system that are still triggering uh, a response? It's not really clear, uh, but, but uh, interesting uh, discoveries are, are happening. Uh, this is uh, more about the neurocognitive impairment. Uh, nice um, uh, review article. Uh, the last slide of my presentation is actually uh, some articles that I uh, uh, would like to share with you, uh, but the impact on the uh, neuro, uh, neuro system is really related to central and also peripheral. So the neurocognitive impairment, the chronic fatigue, neuropathy, uh, uh, myalgias, and, and weakness are a prominent uh, part of this illness. Uh, the cardiopulmonary too, um, are, uh, uh, the pathophysiology is, is fascinating. 
Uh, there could be cardiac injury. There is a significant autonomic uh, nervous system uh, injury. Um, and, and of course, related to the, to the lung. Uh, the most commonly uh, uh, noted is lung fibrosis. It's, it's actually the reaction of the pulmonary um, uh, tissue to injury and injury triggers an activity of inflammation and then remodeling in the lung that produces uh, fibrosis. There is pulmonary vascular disease. There's very non-specific uh, findings in those patients related to significant mm -hmm. air trapping that we see in our patients uh, that is really associated with their uh, dyspnea and fatigue. And uh, we're, we're, we're collecting data uh, about that, but just an observation for now. So uh, one thing that um, I learned from patients when I see them in the clinic and I ask them, so how long did it take you to recover from the acute COVID? And they look at me and they said, we never recovered. So patients who had COVID illness and are still struggling, they are not uh, they may have recovered from an acute viral illness, but they did not recover. They are not healthy. There has been a huge impact on health and well-being. They are. Uh, uh, there has been a huge impact on their physical ability. Uh, mental um, um, uh, problems have been prominent in this patient population. There's a significant psychosocial um, uh, effect of, of their illness. Uh, with their family and their, their community, and, and a huge impact of, of them being able to go back to work, being uh, economically productive, uh, part, of, part of the workforce, and, and therefore, for some patients, this has affected their access to, to care. So uh, seeing those patients in, in our clinic and pulmonary had, had made us very aware of the fact that this is a different uh, population that we need to take care of. And um, this has been one of our uh, missions at Baylor uh, during the pandemic called to care. So we thought this is a continuation of our effort to um, uh, uh, continue caring for those patients. So we wanted to uh, uh, develop uh, a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary post-COVID care clinic to take care of patients who are still suffering, suffering with long-term effects. Our goal was to give state-of-the-art care uh, to those patients. We also thought this is an opportunity for discovery. Uh, so we really wanted to be involved in collecting data and learning more about this illness. Uh, we developed uh, 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 our uh, patient registry. We did value from, from dealing with patients, the value of community involvement, which means the patient community, as we're all aware, uh, this uh, knowledge and this public interest and, and finally government, government interest in post-COVID has been driven by patients and patient uh, support groups. So um, we, we wanted to develop a, a, a program that can provide care, support uh, patients, and also uh, be part of learning, of gaining uh, knowledge. So... Um, Taking how many organs are affected, we developed our, our team. And our team is a dedicated uh, provider, a partner in each one of, of those disciplines at, at Baylor uh, that we thought we might um, uh, need uh, help in managing those patients. And this list keeps on growing. Uh, our last uh, uh, on the list here is ICAMP, is, our, is a research um, a program at Baylor that deals with physical activity and uh, patient monitoring. So they are part of our, our team too, because we understood that this is a more complex patient population that we need to be interacting with. So uh, the team is, 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 is big. Our model is we, we felt we need to keep it centralized. So we didn't want to disperse patients without them having a clinic they can come to. So we have a post-COVID care clinic, and we do uh, see all patients in that clinic. It's now staffed by myself and another colleague, uh, pulmonologist, and uh, we are expanding. So uh, Ms. Love has joined us uh, recently, uh, and I'll talk more about our, our vision of how we can expand access to care. We have evaluated 458 patients in our um, um, a clinic so far, we, our wait time is ridiculous because of the access. 
We have 159 patients uh, scheduled and waiting to be seen. Uh, we have seen patients from um, all over Texas, uh, but also from other states as far as Alaska and, and Puerto Rico. So uh, patient uh, advocacy groups and the patient on social media, they share information and we get referrals, patients travel in uh, to see us. So uh, let me share with you our, the, our patient uh, population. So essentially, uh, most of them, maybe 80% are patients self-referred from the community. They are patients who went on the internet, looked for a clinic and, and uh, uh, asked for an appointment. Uh, predominantly female, I think this is a common observation in multiple studies and from different uh, uh, centers. Um, our, our age group is, is really variable. Uh, we've seen patients less than 20 uh, years, but it's more than 50% are patients between 30 and, and, and 60 or 50 years. So really uh, a young uh, patient population that is part of the workforce. And you can imagine the impact on, 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 the, on society, on individuals uh, with that. So um, um, you're, we live in Texas. Uh, we are a very diverse uh, um, state. Houston is one of maybe the most diverse uh, city. Uh, this will highlight something that's really important that I want to impress on, on all of you. 60% uh, of our uh, patients are uh, white, 15% um, are Black or African American, and 76 are Hispanic. And this is really uh, uh, our, this is the data that made us think really hard about being in one of the most, most diverse uh, cities in the country, about uh, having a huge uh, Hispanic population. And this was, was one of the things that uh, um, uh, brought our attention to a big uh, issue about access to care. And we know that our Hispanic population in Houston particularly was one of the most hit. Uh, with, with, with COVID illness. So uh, data to keep in mind as I, I continue uh, sharing with you with our experience, but access to care and selectivity to care and to COVID care centers is really, is really uh, um, uh, uh, not, not fair. So our patients, uh, definitely we are pulmonologists. So we, we see lots of patients, but pulmonary with, with lung disease, but pulmonary dysfunction is a very common, it's the most common presentation in our patient population. Um, I'm a sleep physician, so we evaluate sleep in, in different uh, um, ways with questionnaires and clinical history, uh, sleep dysfunction, uh, uh, ranging from uh, excessive daytime sleepiness, insomnia is very, is very common. And we have noticed an increased prevalence of sleep disordered breathing, like sleep apnea in this patient population. Even in patients who don't have the usual profile for the sleep apnea patient and the ones who really never had any symptoms before, um, it's not surprising that fatigue is a very common um, uh, presentation too. Uh, uh, multiple uh, neuromuscular presentations from weakness to paresthesias, to um, uh, this sensation of vibration, body vibration that is common for uh, uh, patients for, uh, with post-COVID to present with, uh, lots of uh, uh, psychological impact on our patient uh, group. Uh, cardiac dysfunction is common and more prominently tachycardia and autonomic uh, dysfunction. Smell and taste uh, is, is present persist uh, in, in this patient in 13.8%. Uh, GI symptoms, we have a dedicated uh, team that's working on the gastrointestinal symptoms. There's lots of uh, functional uh, bowel um, uh, uh, dysfunction in this population that we are looking closely uh, into. Uh, headache uh, is common. Uh, patients even, it's not migraine headache. Patients even who had migraine, they tell you this is a different type of, of headache, uh, persistent tinnitus, a vocal cord dysfunction, something to consider on people who are short of breath and you cannot find an explanation or people who have really very weak uh, um, uh, voice when they come back, even though they were never intubated, uh, et cetera. Uh, so this is a summary of the symptoms. The interesting part about this patient population is that 
and patients, no patient looks like the other. Different, they are patients are so unique, but the, but there's a different combination of, of those uh, symptoms. So what have, what have we been uh, observing and doing in our clinic? So as I said, uniqueness of presentation and combination of symptoms. Um, they do have common symptoms, but they don't, two, two patients don't look alike. Uh, the majority of the patients we see in this clinic are not patients uh, that who had severe illness. Patients who had severe illness ended up in the hospital or ended up in the ICU seem to be a different population that is more commonly seen by my other colleagues in pulmonary with lung fibrosis or uh, recovering from ARDS. Uh, but those are patients who were uh, sick at home, uh, maybe never sought any, any medical care and still uh, suffering. They had a variable course of, from acute illness to long COVID to uh, a quote unquote uh, recovery. Uh, we have seen variable impact of vaccination on the post COVID uh, symptoms. We are very aware of a very of a vulnerable population. And when I say vulnerable, it could be the patient uh, themselves. It could be their um, uh, uh, so socioeconomic status, uh, could be their access to care. So uh, we have been uh, uh, made aware of, of, of multiple vulnerable populations. And, and uh, we have patients who have been in the healthcare system seeking help. And it's, it's amazing the excessive uh, resource utilization uh, if those patients are seeking help in the community and not within an, a specialized clinic. Um, so from our observation, and this is, uh, this is a recent uh, article uh, that I put in the references to that look at patients uh, after uh, for, uh, following one year for, for COVID and the recovery. And it seems that maybe the, uh, the percentage of patients who are reporting remission remains to be uh, below 20% even after one year. So something uh, 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 to, to keep uh, in mind that this is uh, an illness that's really going beyond the six month and the one year that we initially thought will happen. So from our experience, patients who uh, get infected with, with COVID uh, are gonna go into four different pathways in their, in their illness uh, 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 journey. It's either they will have severe illness requiring ICU, and this is a completely patient population that we are not commonly seeing in our post-COVID uh, uh, care clinic. Uh, it's, those patients are seen by pulmonologists or cardiologists because they had significant organ dysfunction after uh, their severe illness. But there's a group of patients who had the mild to moderate illness and, and uh, they uh, recovered the acute uh, symptoms, but some of them recovered back to baseline, don't have any long COVID uh, symptoms, and they went back to uh, their normal. There is a group of patients who uh, had persistent or new symptoms after recovery, and, uh, and they continue to linger, but within uh, six, six to uh, 12 months, they, they uh, felt that they have recovered. And I think this is what we're seeing in the maybe 16% of the population in that report. Uh, the patients that are going to be the long COVID patients in our clinic are those uh, patients who had persistent or new symptoms after they recovered from the acute illness uh, going beyond the 12 month. And they have certain characteristics and the literature now is starting to talk more about this. This patient group have this unrelenting fatigue. They have a very typical history of post-exertional uh, fatigue. Uh, so they, if, they, if they can do any activity and they exert and the exertion could be physical, could be mental, uh, they will have, they will crash. They will report to you. They will crash for days or weeks after. Uh, significant cognitive impairment, and, and, and this group also has a common uh, incidence of autonomic uh, dysfunction. So in, in, my, in my experience over the last many months of doing post-COVID, it, it seems that this last patient population are the people who are stuck in that chronic illness that will be presenting and seeking care if it's available. 
So what does it take to take care of those patients? Uh, co care coordination is very important. Uh, it is, if you wanna start a clinic or take care of those patients, you have to be able to, to do that care coordination between the, 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 the central clinic and all the specialists that you, you need to refer to. Access to care remains to be, uh, to be a very uh, um, a big challenge to us and to many others. Our, our plan now moving forward is to expand to include primary care providers. And uh, in my opinion, primary care providers are gonna be the future post-COVID uh, uh, care providers, uh, but they need to be really willing to deal with this uh, challenging patient population. And they also need to be trained and need to be situated within a supportive system that can help. Mental health and cognitive behavioral therapy are a, a big part of, of what we do. Uh, we, we really have the support of our colleagues in psychology and psychiatry, and now we have our own psychologist in, in our clinic to be able to help those patients. Um, access to pulmonary and advanced lung disease is, is really important. Uh, being able to assess and manage autonomic and vascular dysfunction. Uh, exercise physiology assessment. Um, uh, I've learned the lesson really hard. I, I used to send my patient for pulmonary rehab and none of them uh, got better because this patient group really needs a very specific um, uh, a process for going back into exercise. And this will include physical and, and breathing exercises. And we hear from patients talking about pacing. They have learned uh, to do that, which means do a little rest, do a little rest. So I'll, I'll talk more about that. Cognitive evaluation. A majority of patients are presenting with cognitive impairment. Uh, fortunately, with testing, we're not finding too many, too significant impairment, but we're providing um, uh, opportunities for uh, cognitive uh, rehab. Uh, our ENT team have been very uh, active in uh, smell and taste uh, uh, retraining for patients and uh, sleep disorder management, uh, essentially treating uh, insomnia, optimizing their sleep and underlying sleep disorder has been, have been very helpful as it's one of the biggest contributors for their uh, daytime fatigue. So uh, our care has been focused on uh, the physical well-being, really neurocognitive uh, assessment and rehab, wanted them to get be able to go back to work, to get back to their health and, and provide the psychological uh, support and, and, and counseling they needed. Uh, we're also um, um, involved in research. Our pulmonary uh, colleagues uh, are uh, doing research on the lung fibrosis uh, related to COVID. We have uh, had a trial on um, uh, electrical stimulation to the lower extremity to regain perfusion and muscle endurance. We have a post-COVID-19 registry and more, more projects on the way. Uh, this is really a very interesting data from our electrical stimulation that showed that we improved endurance and oxygen delivery to muscles in the lower extremities. So something that we will continue to follow on and, and share data. Uh, we have uh, gone really above and beyond to work on exercise uh, for this group. Uh, uh, there is a specific group I always talk about. It's uh, young females who used to be very physically active who are now uh, stuck uh, with long COVID and uh, uh, unable to go back to exercise. So we are uh, developing our own uh, exercise physiology assessment, uh, including autonomic assessment, assessment and coming up with individualized um, uh, protocols for patients to exercise. So this is an example of our acute phase um, 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 protocol for patients with post-COVID is going to be based on an individual assessment and then an individual prescription to be able to help with that. So um, as, as I, uh, I said before, uh, we did know there was vulnerable populations. We noted those. We knew that we realized the barriers to access to care, even for patients who can't come to our practice, 
uh, a lot of uh, knowledge or um, misinformation about the illness, and 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 we thought we have a we have a role there in spreading knowledge and and provide resources to patients. There is a geographic um, 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 barrier too. There's health barrier too. Uh, we we wanted to um, to to do something about this. So this is something that I'm really interested. Um, uh, that I get an opportunity to share with you. So we are, uh, we have a, now a project that we're doing with Harris Health, which is the um, uh, county health system in, in, in Houston. Uh, we are uh, uh, piloting the Baylor College of Medicine long COVID model system of care. This is HRSA funded. Uh, and our goal was is to establish a primary care based long COVID model system of care. So we are very excited. This will be our pilot to develop a primary care led uh, clinic that is supported by a network of specialists uh, to, to deliver care to patients. And the area uh, that was selected is an area that is really um, uh, had been uh, very much impacted by uh, COVID illness. And it's one of the poorest uh, districts in, 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 in Houston. And maybe it's the lowest in the country for um, uh, in health insurance uh, coverage. So very excited about this uh, opportunity and very lucky to have partners in primary care who have been willing to, to do that with us. So I definitely think uh, we're getting somewhere. I, I do remember the days when we started doing the clinic. Uh, it was uh, a very psychologically traumatizing experience um, to see those patients who were really seeking help and, and uh, seeking to be uh, heard and, and validated. Uh, uh, several months later now, I feel we are doing a better job in understanding I, I do want to say that this is a partnership, so I'm excited to be partnering with primary care. I'm excited to with the partnership with our subspecialists too, but I also look forward to partnering with other institutions who are doing, doing similar work. So thank you. Uh, my last slide is uh, uh, um, a few articles that I thought would be helpful. So um, thank you for this opportunity and I'll end my presentation here. Thank you, Dr. Shaib. That, that was wonderful. I want to invite Dr. Tierney to share a few slides and some information with us about long COVID research and also what we can look to in the near future. Hi, thank you so much. Um, Dr. Shaib, that was fantastic. And, and I look forward to talking to you about collaboration and, and sharing ideas. Um, you know, we have uh, a lot of long COVID patients here and fascinatingly enough for, um, you know, things really started in Nebraska in the middle of the state, not in Omaha and Lincoln where they normally do because that's where our meatpacking plants are. Mm -hmm. And so um, our pulmonary teams in the middle of the state from, from CHI um, really uh, gained expertise and therefore started to see long COVID sooner um, than folks in Omaha and Lincoln. So I, I really look forward to, to trying to do some collaboration uh, in the future. Um, my few slides are, are really more uh, a little bit on the epidemiology of long COVID. Um, I only want to emphasize things. I mean, Dr. Shaib's presentation was so thorough. I'm only going to focus on, on additional sort of thoughts. Um, uh, and, you know, I think that Dr. Shaib presented, you know, the long-term sequelae, you know, long-term COVID, post-COVID sequelae are really not one, it's not necessarily one condition or one phenomenon. It's a it's a sort of constellation of, of different syndromes, um, you know, and how much of that is due to different etiologies, such as the damage that can occur in severe disease, um, autoimmune phenomena, et cetera. Um, is it different based on the different variants, the different waves of disease? Um, and I think the answer to the second question, we really don't know yet. Um, but this is something similar to what um, Dr. Shai presented. But one question, and I know Dr. Quinn may uh, ask a question about this later, is how much might be due to some viral persistence um, and in different pockets of uh, viral persistence in different organ tissue. 
is uh, people have looked at that, but it's not definitively known at this point in time. And this is just a, a graphic that I think underscores what Dr. Shaib already presented. But how common is long COVID? And I think uh, Dr. Shaib also talked about this, but one of the, the issues is that it, it, the estimates vary so dramatically depending on the definition. So the definition for many studies, which were started before the WHO definition came out, which was sort of um, focusing on two months of persi persistent symptoms occurring within three months, starting within three months of recovery from acute disease, a lot of um, studies actually look at one month of persistent symptoms. Um, and uh, and so therefore your ranges from 5% to 75% in a whole variety of your studies. I think the overall general perspective is it's probably about 30% if you consider um, all etiologies together. But in particular, if you wanna try and look at um, after my you know, mild to moderate disease, as you mentioned, is if you take your hospitalized patients out of that in terms of trying to get a sense of what's the incidence after mild to moderate disease. This is really um, interesting. This is a, uh, this actually just came out within the past, about the past two weeks. It's data collected from the household pulse survey, which is something that's actually um, executed by the US Census Bureau and analyzed by CDC's National Center for Health Statistics. Um, and they collected this data over a two-week period in June. And according to this data, um, one in 13 adults reported quote unquote long COVID symptoms, but that was this was defined as symptoms lasting three or four more months. So this is uh, you know, longer persistence and not clearly in line with WHO definitions. But it showed some patterns that I think we've already seen is that older adults are less likely to report long COVID than younger adults. So um, the you know 40 to 60 range or 50 to 59 in particular have um, about three times higher the rate of long COVID than those over 80. Women are more likely than men. Um, in, in these data, um, Hispanic adults had a rate of about 9% in comparison to non-Hispanic whites at 7.5 and African-Americans at 6.8%. Um, and then a lower percentage of non-Hispanic Hispanic Asian adults. Regional differences were also seen. So the states with the highest percentage were Kentucky, Alabama, and Tennessee. Um, and South Dakota, and then the lowest were Hawaii, Maryland, and Virginia. Um, I'd like to map that out actually with uh, what the percentage of uh, vaccination is in those states. Um, and just looking at those states and, and knowing what that map is, I think that there is correlation and, and some data I'll talk about in a few minutes would be consistent with lower rates in states with higher vaccination penetrance. Um, this is a very recent article um, that looked at uh, the global prevalence of post-COVID, um, and it looked at, uh, you know, incidents really around the world. Um, it's a meta-analysis of, they started looking at over 4,000 articles and got down to 41 that met their criteria. And one of those with that there was over 350 patients in any study that was included to have enough power. Um, again, this was symptom one symptom for greater than 28 days. So this is um, less rigorous than the WHO definition. But with that definition, they found a global prevalence of 0.43, with it being in hospitalized patients 0.54 and non-hospitalizations 0.34 with women having a greater prevalence than men. But I think one of the most interesting things in this is the, is the difference um, geographically, that incidence in Asia was uh, 0.51, Europe 0.44, and the USA 0.31. Um, in this overall large meta-analysis with very varied studies, they really only found one condition that was consistent in terms of a predilection for higher incidence, which was asthma, 
but in many of the individual studies, things that we already know, age, severity of disease, and comorbidity were associated with higher incidence of post-COVID. But the two other things I, I thought were, or at least the one, this first um, list here, when it looked at what is the incidence at follow-up intervals? So at 30 days, 0.37, 60 days, 0.25, but then you look at 90 and 100 days and those numbers seem to go up. But again, it's one of those things where you really have to look at the data themselves. The studies that had longer follow-up were actually studies that were looking more, had a higher um, group of hospitalized patients as opposed to non-hospitalized patients. And then I think the symptoms were, as Dr. Shayib already mentioned, you know, fatigue being the most common, memory problems, pulmonary disease, sleep difficulties, and joint pain um, were the symptoms most commonly reported in this international study. But I think, you know, from, from a public health perspective, what's one of the most important questions um, that I see? which is how much can vaccination prevent um, the incidence of post-COVID? And in particular, in, um, you know, we clearly know that by preventing severe disease um, and preventing hospitalization, we're going to pre prevent the post-COVID that comes from the direct damage that we've already talked about. So it's separate from the hospitalized patients. So if you're looking at non-hospitalized patients, are you going to see a significant effect? And, and the data um, it will often mix the two, but really the preponderance of data, in my mind, clearly shows that vaccination reduces post-COVID. Um, this was a, a review that came out in February from the uh, UK Health Security Agency, and it looked at probably the, the up until that point in time, the eight most um, robust studies that looked at whether vaccination reduced long COVID um, beyond just reducing the incidence of COVID and particularly severe COVID. Um, the VA study showed only a 30, 13% reduction, um, but again, it was a preponderance of older white males. Um, but there is the Antonelli, Senjamin, Quoti, Simon studies all showed reductions of over 45% um, in the reduction of post-COVID syndrome. There was uh, one study that didn't show a composite reduction, but when you looked at specific symptoms, such as fatigue, lung disease, hair loss, significant reductions were noted. There was only one study which looked at potentially an increase. Um, if you look at that study, the way they defined their cases, um, makes you sort of question this, uh, uh, the experimental methods in this study. But another very recent um, study that I think supports this in addition was a study that looked at Italian healthcare workers who from March of 2020 uh, through April of 2022 were followed with PCRs taken every two weeks um, if they were no, had a known exposure or developed symptoms, then they were tested more frequently. All were supposed to be vaccinated and boosted, um, and uh, they excluded any hospitalized healthcare workers to try and get at this question of prevention of uh, post-COVID that was not from direct disease, from severe disease. And they followed it through three waves. So the original strain, the alpha strain, and then in Italy, the Delta sort of the Delta wave and the first Omicron wave were sort of one long wave. And what they found was of these 2,560 healthcare workers, there were 739 cases of COVID. 229 of the 739 were diagnosed as having long COVID, which again, they diagnosed it as four weeks of prolonged symptoms. And because they were actually able to, you know, they were following this over time as people became more vaccinated, but um, that in those, so prior to vaccination, 42% developed long COVID. After one shot, it was 30%, after two, 17, and after three, 16%. By wave, you see, see a significant reduction, and that's because by the third wave is when people had their, were able to get their first booster or their third shot. So that, you know, these two um, sets of data and studies, I think are very consistent and, you know, are the most important 
um, preponderance of evidence that says that vaccination does indeed pre prevent post-acute uh, COVID. Um, I just wanted to put in uh, two slides to provide some references on long COVID in children. I know that's uh, going to be vaccination in children and long COVID in children is going to be the topic of another um, discussion, but clearly the incidence appears to be lower, but um, in several, several studies, there was an incidence which probably averages about 5%. So much smaller percentages in smaller numbers, but not insignificant um, incidents. And this is a list of references on pediatric long COVID. So, you know, my final points, um, the first being very consistent with Dr. Shaib said that the incidence of post-COVID, um, the you know, sequelae of post-COVID is extremely significant that it's a more than one type of syndrome and that we need to uh, do everything in our power to prevent it, um, as well as coming up with the best models to treat patients. But uh, I think getting in our messaging from a public health standpoint, especially now that the bivalent vaccines are out um, and also Novavax is out, is how important it is to push again for vaccination to not only, you know, the major messaging is let's prevent people from dying, getting severe disease, getting hospitalized. But I think we need to put into that messaging is how important vaccination can also be in preventing long COVID. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Tierney. John, wondering if we can move to the panel discussion. Thanks. Um, Dr. Quinn, I'll hand it over to you for our first question for the panel. Sure, I'm sure there's uh, plenty of questions coming from outside, but two uh, pretty well-featured articles in the lay press this week, one in The Guardian and one in Wall Street Journal, that I wanted our panel to comment on. Uh, one commented on or opined that uh, the, the uh, significant presence of psychosocial stressors pre-COVID were a predictor of uh, the likelihood of development long COVID. And the second, addressing persistent viral load as a possible etiology. So I wonder if our panel could uh, comment on those two uh, theories proposed, because I'm sure our patients will be reading it and coming in with questions. I, I think in, in, I'll take the latter one first is, um, you know, there, there are other data, as, as I mentioned earlier in some of my slides, that have looked at persistent viral um, load, particularly in certain places where you can have sort of reservoirs, um, and particularly neurologically, uh, that, that they, there are some other data that suggests that that may be one of the etiologies. And I think this study um, lends additional credence to that. But I think what it basically suggests is, is further real understanding of that viral persistence is really necessary. And then, you know, hopefully is the inspiration for studies that look at, um, you know, whether or not uh, longer antiviral therapies, you know, the fact that there is a significant amount of rebound after Paxlovid, you know, makes me question, you know, why aren't we studying longer courses of, of antivirals to try and reduce viral reservoirs? So I think it's a, I think it's a very plausible etiology and one that needs much further study. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, I agree on that. And I can comment on the uh, psychosocial. Um, I, I think this is a fascinating observation. It, it holds uh, true in our clinical observation with patients. Um, uh, the the, the pre-existing psychosocial has, uh, may, has put the patient in a vulnerable uh, state. And from our clinical observations at Baylor is even the the uh, impact of that on their acute illness, how much they were able to deal with it, how much support they had, and also how much access to care they had. And I, I think that all is, is gonna be confounding the, their, their tendency to develop long COVID. So I'm not surprised by this data. I think it's fascinating and it's trying to give us a bigger perspective on the patient vulnerability, vulnerabilities. <laughs> Thank you. And you know, I'm wondering, you both sort of alluded to the fact that it really is multifaceted, the syndrome. And I'm wondering, you know, how do we approach a multifaceted syndrome 
is it in a multidisciplinary, multi-professional way? And Miss Love, especially for you as somebody who's in our pre-discussion, you had mentioned inpatient experience and then now post-COVID sequelae. So I'm wondering if you wanted to share your thoughts on it. Sure. Um, so I thought I was frozen there. Um, so I had the opportunity to work in um, our uh, clinic at home, which was a telemedicine clinic where we took care of patients in um, the active phase of COVID and um, really experienced, you know, what they went through um, uh, from a psychosocial and a physical standpoint and have transitioned over into the post-COVID clinic with Dr. Shaib. And she mentioned earlier about um, the wait time that we have for, for patients being able to have access um, to our care. And I think um, utilizing your APPs, your PAs, and your nurse practitioner providers um, within um, the practice of taking care of these long COVID patients is essential. Um, you know, you can utilize our, our, our skill set with evaluation and providing extended care and education um, to open up access um, for, you know, physician providers to see the patients initially. So, for example, um, the way that we have our model set up is, you know, Dr. Shaib and our physicians will see um, the patients initially, and I will oftentimes see them in follow up. And um, it, you know, by me engaging with the follow up, it opens up um, more access to the patients to utilize our clinic. So basically, um, I collaborate with Dr. Shaib, you know, in the management of the patients um, who've been seen. Uh, when I see them in follow up, I'm able to reassess, you know, where they are, what their goals are, any new symptoms that they may have, and to continue with the evaluation um, because it is very complex. Um, and, um, you know, having the APPs as well to provide follow up care offers opportunities for education as well. Patients have lots of questions, they have lots of concerns. It's a great way to be able to make sure they understand you know, what it is that we're doing, what the goals are from our end and um, from their end as well, so. That's great. I know we're almost at time, but uh, Dr. Quinn, I wanted to ask if you had any other questions for I, our panel. I'm gonna sneak in one more hard one yeah. and maybe for Dr. Tierney. It, it's interesting that uh, there's a different outcome or likelihood of building post COVID after vaccination. But we also know the cohort of people who get vaccinated is different from the people who don't get vaccinated. Do you think we'll be able to tease apart the differences in uh, predisposition to get vaccinated from likelihood of developing uh, post long COVID? Um, I'm not sure we're going to be able to tease that out, actually. But I do think that the study that looked at the healthcare workers who were all required to get vaccinated. Um, and then the percentages of those that developed post-COVID or not um, is able to give us a little bit of a truer perspective as to what kind of behavior people um, sort of are doing. That even in, in healthcare workers who are likely um, to be practicing um, the best prevention, both at work and not at work, I mean, not always, but I think it's a proxy for that shows us what the incidence is in that population. So I think that's somewhat helpful. I, I guess I'm fishing in a roundabout way for more evidence to educate patients that getting vaccinated is a good idea. Yeah. Um, well, I, you know, I think the, that the amount of data that's out there in terms of presentation is actually pretty robust. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things that we found just locally in terms of college students, the one thing that college students fear that really worries them is this anosmia, loss of taste and smell. They're really concerned about that. They're not really, oh, I'm not going to die. I'm not going to get hospitalized, but oh my goodness, I won't be able to taste, you know, you know, those, those tacos or that beer or whatever. That's, that seems to hit home. And so we've used that a little bit locally in trying to convince college students to get vaccinated. Thank you. That's fantastic. I feel like that's a great way of activating patients <laughs> and engaging them in, in a way that's very meaningful for themselves. Um, 
Well, this is a phenomenal conversation. We know that this is only part one of multiple series that we would like to think about as, as data evolves, as research evolves, and our own clinical practices evolve. So we would love to have you all back. Uh, thank you so much for being part of our panel and for speaking to us about this. And for our audiences, um, we will share the recording uh, as well as the articles that we've mentioned. Uh, so that email is shortly to come. Thank you. And a special thank you to Dr. Quinn for joining me as a co-host. So thanks. Oh, it was a delight. Thanks. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Bye, everybody. Including thank us. you.